So thank you very much, the Columbus Foundation, for hosting us tonight as well as hosting the application. If you haven't applied for grants before um, through the Columbus Foundation, they make it very simple and they made it simple for us with getting all the information to them to make sure that it gets out to you all um, in an easy uh, format. So, oh, my name is Jaleesa Dawkins, and I am the Columbus Garden Grant Administrator, and I am here with Carol, and she is the Administrator for the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation, and Bill Dawson is with Franklin Park Conservatory, but is the Administrator for the Franklin County side of the grant as well. And so, we are here to talk about the Urban Gardening Grant. And the purpose is to provide financial and material resources to organizations who aim to repurpose un underused land to create, continue, or expand community gardens and green spaces for the purposes of, one, increasing healthy, affordable, and local food access and education, particularly for gardens that benefit people in low to moderate income neighborhoods, Two, connecting individuals to the life-enhancing benefits of community gardens and green spaces, including health and wellness, therapeutic, environmental, community engagement, community building with people of various cultures and backgrounds, and beautification. And three, bolstering community pride. So we have a very robust purpose statement. And if you ever have any questions about is your project, um, does it align with um, this garden grant, go to that purpose statement and you should be able to get your answer there. So for this workshop today, we're gonna go over the application platform. So where you'll go on the Columbus Foundation to apply, the actual application that will be available on Friday the review criteria, so you can know exactly what we are looking for when we're reviewing these applications. The final report, additional documents that um, are necessary for this application. We'll take some questions and then we'll let you go. So I'm going to pass it on to Carol and she's going to talk about the evolution of this garden grant. Thanks, Jaleesa. Hi, everybody. I am Carol Kaufman Nallen, and I'm here on behalf of the Scott's Miracle Girl Foundation, as Jaleesa said. And uh, in my day-to-day uh, -day work, one of the best parts of my work is running and managing our garden grants uh, to organizations um, such as the ones that you all represent. And I've been working with Scott's Miracle Girl for the past two years. And I have a, a funny little story. So I have a daughter, Sylvie, who's 11. And when I started in this role and, and would come home and tell her about all of the gardens that all of you all are um, starting and nurturing, she was really interested in this and, and finally got so inspired that this past spring, she initiated uh, planting a pollinator garden at her school all by herself with just a little bit of help from mom. And um, I couldn't have been prouder of her. So you know, just know that you all are doing amazing work and that uh, young people all around you are watching and also getting inspired by it. So as Jaleesa said, the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation, the City of Columbus, and Franklin County have all offered separate grant programs, but very similar programs annually to further the development of community gardens and green spaces throughout central Ohio. And so um, Jaleesa and Bill and I were talking earlier this spring about how can we make this process easier for uh, the grantees and the applicants? Um, how can we streamline it, maybe reduce uh, redundancy or paperwork? Um, Side note, I used to be in your shoes and apply for grants for many years, and so I'm quite familiar with all of the, the process that goes with applying and um, waiting anxiously for that email to come in and then keeping track of reporting deadlines. And so we were all really in agreement that we wanted to make this um, easier and more streamlined for you. So to that end, in 2020, we're going to utilize one application and review process. And we will be doing that with the goal to really maximize the funding and the material resources that we can make available for your gardens. And so I do want to also just say that this in no way changes our commitment to Central Ohio and to the um, hometown grants that we've been making now for 18 years. The Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation and Scott's Miracle Grow Company have been uh, investing in gardens throughout the area. In fact, um, I asked Haley the other day, uh, how many has that totaled up to in the past 18 years? And um, still tabulating some of the older um, records, but it's more than 320 
garden grants that we have made over the past 18 years. And so this is also the 10th year for the city of Columbus and Franklin County. So it's really a, a, a program with deep roots and we're just trying to improve it and make it even um, more effective in the years to come. And so it will be a $3,000 cash request limit this year. And you will also be able to request product uh, from Scott's miracle Grow as in past years. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But I'm gonna turn it over to Haley, who is the let me see if I get your title right, Haley. Community Research and Grants Management Associate Officer at the Columbus Foundation. Well, welcome everyone to the Columbus Foundation. I'm so glad you're here uh, joining us. Um, I work with uh, this great crew of people every year to help administer these garden grant programs. Some of you may have heard from me via email. Um, when we uh, are announcing the opportunity or collecting final reports. And so I'm really um, here to talk about, you know, how to utilize our website and access the application. And then I'm also really should be, you know, considered a resource for you um, over the next couple of months as you think about your application, if you have questions about navigating our site. Um, and then I'm gonna point out some other resources that are available to you too, uh, to you as well um, in this process. but. First, I just want to jump in and um, invite you all to take a look at the screen where I have the Columbus Foundation's homepage pulled up. So we have here um, our main menu button, which is where I would invite you to navigate when you're ready to explore these grants. The Nonprofit Center is really sort of the hub of all of the details that you need for this or any other grant program that is being offered through the foundation. Um, if you go to the Nonprofit Center, you see details about um, the Giving Store, which is a platform for nonprofits to be listed and receive gifts through our site, our crowdfunding platform, Better Together, um, our nonprofit toolkit, which we'll navigate to in a few minutes that has final reporting forms and other logos and uh, details. Um, um, but we're gonna focus, of course, on this particular grant opportunity. So you'll go to Explore and Apply under Grant Opportunities. And the urban gardening grant is listed here under our fund for targeted needs. This is also where the City of Columbus grant and Franklin County grant and um, Scott's Miracle Grow grant links were listed before. But as uh, you heard, this is now a merged and combined program. Um, and we're excited for all the opportunity that will bring to you guys as applicants. And um, I think ultimately it's really going to streamline the process um, as, a, as a grant maker as well. So I'm going to jump into this page, and you can see we have um, some great details about the program. So I'm not going to read this out loud to everyone here, but I do encourage you to spend some time on this page to really understand sort of the changes that have been put in place for the 2020 season. Um, again, as Jalisa referenced, you know, the focus and priorities of uh, these funding partners are really well described here. Where I want to just focus some attention is um, the eligibility requirements. So for this grant, um, you, we welcome applications from organizations that have 501c3 nonprofit status or those um, groups or um, collaboratives that are working with a nonprofit with that status as their fiscal sponsor. And we always want to emphasize that you, um, if you are working with a fiscal sponsor or fiscal agent, um, that you have a good relationship with that group, that you're transparent on the front end about um, expectations of uh, if they were to receive the grant on your behalf, um, who your contact person is, who our contact person is, if we're administering the grant to them. So think about that as you, um, as you anticipate your application. Starting on the 30th of this month, um, so later this week, a link to the application will be located right under this heading, Grant Application Process. Uh, so you will be find, find the direct link to the app here. Um, you're prompted, um, as it's described here, that you must be logged into the website in order to access the application. If you do not have a username and password set up on our site, you can register using this link um, that's noted here. You can also, from any page on our website, go to, this will say log in uh, when we're not logged in. You can click on that button and it will prompt you to a link to register. It's free to register, it takes just a couple minutes and it will allow you to um, submit the application and also return to any applications you have in progress, uh, track um, the status of your application and uh, 
basically, you know, have a, a more permanent connection to our site. So uh, Jalisa is going to review um, some of the documentation that's listed here. Um, but what I want to do is jump us uh, into the application, kind of show you the first page that you'll encounter um, when you're here. And to do that, because we're not posted yet, I just have to do a quick copy and paste. This is not what you'll need to do. Um, Sorry, we'll do this one more time. If we weren't filming this, I wouldn't be so nervous, but let's see. <laughs> okay. You know what, if we don't mind, if you don't mind, Lisa, I may need to pull this up separately and we can just jump into one of the existing applications. Okay. Um, generally, though, when you click on the application link, and, and Jalisa's going to jump into one um, that's in existence, you'll have a couple of questions around your eligibility. Um, so that'll ask you if you are a nonprofit or if you're partnering with a fiscal agent, if you're aware of the grant timeline. Um, it really kind of gives you just the broad framework so you can check and make sure that you're applying for the right grant and that you, your organization is eligible to pursue it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jalisa. All right, so I'm going to go through an application. This is the second part um, that you'll see. So like Haley said, you'll see the eligibility, el eligibility questions, which are five questions. And then um, if you have answered the appropriate answer, it will take you to this page. And so, um, you know what? Raise your hand for me if you have applied to the Columbus and Franklin County Community Garden Grant or the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation grant in the past. Okay, so you probably have seen this page before. Um, for those who haven't, it's pretty um, straightforward. It asks you, and let me see if I can make it just a little larger. Is that better? Those in the back, can you see? Okay, great. So it'll ask, what's your fiscal sponsor organization name? So if that, if you are the 501c3, then you put your um, name right there, or the organization name. If you're partnering with a fiscal sponsor, then make sure their um, name and their contact information is filled in in this portion. I ask you the address, the city, state zip, and then the phone number. Make sure that this is a, a phone number that somebody can actually be reached. Um, nobody is calling, you know, 20 million times a day. This is, if there's serious information that we need, we need to, you know, use this number. So a direct line would be great. The information is not sold. So then um, we need the fiscal sponsor executive's title, their prefix, their name, and then an email address. You click save and continue, and then it goes to the project manager's information. So their prefix, their name, email address, phone number, and then here's a drop down where you can select if you would like to sign up for quarterly updates for the urban gardening grant. So this could be information about other funding opportunities or you know, uh, making sure that you have any additional resources that you may need to complete the final um, report. Um, or, or anything else, but we're not going to bombard your email um, account with, with um, this communication. So then you'll want to include the garden name, the garden address, the actual physical location, and then the parcel ID number, which I'll go over in a moment. Actually, let's just go ahead and do it now. So there's a document that you'll find, we'll, we'll see it at the end of this, but it's the parcel summary um, instruction. And so um, you can click here or you can type in that address, select search by address, and all of these instructions are in that document. And you'll put in the garden location.
And so the parcel ID number is right here at the top of the page. And that's the information that you want to copy over into that section right here. And I'm going to show you while I'm here what else you'll need to do. So once you put in the address and you've seen this, this um, page, you're going to go to Print Parcel Summary. And it's processing over here. And you'll download this document, save it to your desktop, and then you'll upload it. And I'll show you where you're going to upload it at the end. Um, but it just seemed fitting to go ahead and take you here. All right. So there's the report. And this document is, um, is necessary to complete your application. And it really just helps us to see the tax district and to see who is the owner of the property. And so, as I said, you'll want to download this and save it. So know where you've saved it. I'm just saving everything to the desktop right now. because you'll have to upload it later. All right. So I've put the parcel ID in, and then is this garden site located on a land bank property? You will know that. Um, that's a yes or no. And Seth, a little later on, is going to talk about um, the land bank and the great resources they have. This is a different question this year. What is the square footage of the act area actively gardened? This should not be the entire lot only where produce or plants are being grown. So if you are on a quarter acre lot, we don't want a quarter of an acre put in here. We want the space that you're actually growing in. This is important for our reporting. And so if you have any issues with measuring this out, then you can go ahead and call. Um, there is a number on there. Uh, on the grant homepage for the help desk. And they'll be able to get you in contact with somebody, which will most likely be Bill, <laughs> who will be able to. Walking off. <laughs> <laughs> By this and time. Yes. Square footage is great. <laughs> so, yeah, Bill will be able to walk you through how to measure that growing space. So again, this is not the lot size. This is the actual growing space. Okay, and then is this a new garden that has never existed before? So uh, maybe this is the first time you're applying to this grant, but the garden has existed for five years and you've just been able to get funding from elsewhere. Um, that would not be a new garden. A new garden is you are just digging into the ground or you are just putting up those beds or whatever it may be, um, you are just starting to grow in 2020. So what is the purpose of the garden? You tell us. And then if you have a target underserved population, we want you to include um, who they may be. And so this is just a, an example. These are a, This is a list um, that is not 100% inclusive. So um, feel free to share what your target population um, may be. But this is a good example um, that's included in, in here. So then your project start date, the project end date, and then the amount requested. You will be putting this in a project budget, but it helps us to see it in this um, document as well. Then you'll go ahead and save and continue. And as Carol mentioned, the um, upward limit this year is $3,000. So then the overview is a background of why a garden and this project, uh, and this project is, is a particular fit for what the organization is trying to achieve. And it just helps us tie in, you know, when we see the organization and maybe it, you know, doesn't necessarily lend itself to uh, thinking that they would have a garden. This is the piece that helps us tie this together. When we can see what your organization goals are, um, we can then put the project together with it. So then the application is broken down into three segments. We're looking at the impact, the capacity, and the sustainability of the garden. And so for the questions under impact, 
we are looking to understand what the impact of the garden would like to have on the community. And so we're asking you in this section to describe um, what the garden would like to achieve and why it is important for the community it wishes to influence. So what I've done is um, what's written in the text here is the actual review criteria, which you can access on that landing page. And is it, let me just pull it up here. So here's that landing page again. If you scroll down, you can select review criteria. And it's pulling directly from here. So question one, what are the goals for the garden in 2020? And then these are the, the points that we're going to um, judge this application based on. So I've just copied all of that criteria here for us so we don't have to go back and forth. So what are the goals for the garden in 2020 and beyond? We're looking to see that the applicant provided clear goals for the garden and that the stated goals align with the purpose of the Urban Gardening Grant, which that purpose statement is on the home page yet again. And here's that grant purpose. How will the funding achieve the goals of the garden? We're looking to see that the applicant described how the goals will be achieved with the requested funding and that that funding aligned with the purpose of the garden, of the garden grant. Describe who will benefit from the garden. We wanna make sure that you're sharing that clear target audience. So if you had an underserved population that you selected in the previous page, make sure you're um, explaining that here in this portion. And then the second part that we're looking for is that there's a link between the goals of the garden and the audience that you wish to benefit. How will you use the funding to engage the people you wish to benefit from the garden? Applicant described how the funding will be used to benefit the target audience. So it's not really a trick. We don't want to you know, throw anybody. Um, we want to make sure that you can do as well as possible um, on this application. And that's why we're including the review criteria that the um, reviewers actually will be looking at when they're um, judging your application. So for this question, estimate how many people will benefit from the garden activities. Of this number, how many will be youth under the age of 18? And so. If you serve youth that are under the age of 18, make sure you include that number. It's really important for reporting. And if you don't serve youth under age 18, that's okay. Just make sure you share that that's not your target audience. So we're looking um, for an estimate. We know this is an estimate. And the final report is where we ask you to actually report your numbers. Um, but this just gets you thinking, what programming do I need to have in order to, to achieve um, these goals? And these are goals that you're setting for yourself. So estimate um, the number of how many people, how many people um, will benefit from the activities, address if, address if there are any youth that will benefit, and then provide the details. So um, say you wanted 30 people to um, receive food donations. You wanted to engage 20 people as volunteers, and you wanted to have 10 that um, participated in educational programming. This is where you would include that information. What type of plants will be grown in the garden? And again, I know that this changes, um, but give a great, you know, a good estimate. We'll ask you in the final report to make sure that you're including what plants you planted um, and how many um, were grown or how many pounds, where it was distributed. So you'll want to make sure you're keeping a log of that information. But again, this is just to get you thinking through what you need to be doing, how you need to plan for the upcoming growing season. Then we'll describe in detail how the items grown will be distributed, used, and or sold. And so that's, you know, if you want to give to a food pantry, then you can include that. If you plan to sell all of your produce, then include that. Um, it's whatever your distribution plan is. But again, we have to start thinking through these things um, to make sure that you have a successful project. The next section is capacity. The Urban Gardening Grant wants to ensure that the applicant group has the experienced personnel necessary to achieve the desired outcomes outlined in the proposal. Please answer the following questions to illustrate how the applicant has the capacity to manage the garden. 
So the two questions under here are describe the garden leader or volunteer group that will be responsible for managing the garden. Include any training and experience the leader or group has in garden management. And so for those who may have applied last year, this question was broken down into about 50 million parts. And this year we've broken it down. We're just asking, you know, a simple question. And here are the three parts um, or the three criteria that we're looking for. Did you provide an overview of the leader volunteer group? Did you describe the experience or training that that group or that leader has in garden management? And we're not looking, you know, to see that they went to school for 10 years. Um, we just want to know, you know, they've managed a garden for six months or they've done um, the urban gardening uh, or the urban master gardener um, series, whatever classes they may have taken. And then you don't have to list out all of them, but just give us a nice overview of what experience the group has to carry out this project. And then the third is the applicant demonstrated um, that the leader of the volunteer group's capacity to carry out the project long term. So then the next question is, a strong volunteer base is necessary for a successful garden project. Describe the volunteer recruitment and management plan. And we know that this can make or break some of the garden. So we really want you to be thinking again in advance, how are you going to get the people necessary to get the work done in this garden? So have you described how the volunteers would be recruited? And how will you retain the volunteers? Is that actually realistic? And then listing, what are some of those things that you want the volunteers to do? And then the last section for these questions is sustainability. So this grant is not intended to be the only source of funds or supplies contributing to the creation, continuation, or expansion of the garden. So use this section to describe the resources planned for the garden, including volunteers and material. So what resources other than this grant will be used to sustain the garden and achieve its goals in 2020 and beyond? And this is not just saying that, you, that we're looking to see that you've gotten funding from other places. It doesn't just take money to manage a, a garden. It takes people, it takes supplies, it takes a lot of things. So that's what goes into the sustainability section. So we're looking for other monetary or personnel resources that were listed other than the grant. Um, also, if you have any other funding requests that are out, maybe you haven't heard back from the funder yet, still go ahead and include that information in this section. And then um, we're looking to see that those resources were actually adequate to support the garden. So if this grant, we don't foresee this, but if this grant were taken out of the picture and it was no longer a resource for you, would you be able to continue this garden? Have you started making those connections with other people and other funders maybe? And then if there's any additional information that we didn't ask that you think is really important to share with us, you put it in this section and it's not scored. And here are all of the attachments. So I'm going to, I'm gonna come back with the budget and the product request and Carol's gonna go through that. Um, we're gonna look at the application acknowledgement form So this document gave everybody a little bit of, um, you know, inks last year, and we've tried to simplify it a little bit. So this is the one you'll want to prepare for ahead of time. So don't complete the application the day before it's due, which is October the 30th, I believe. So um, because you're actually going to need some signatures from everyone. So. One other thing I want to point out, because this is tricky, it actually um, stumped me a little bit. So we're here back on the application. When you select application acknowledgement form, it pulls it up as a PDF in the browser. You need to download, do not type a thing. Download the acknowledgement form first. You'll save it. Select that, you know, the area that you want to save it, that you'll remember where it is. 
then you'll pull it up from there and actually, then you'll type in and save it, okay? Does that make sense? All right, because if you type in in the browser and then you hit save, it's not gonna actually save it and you're gonna have a blank document and you did all of that work for nothing. So download it, save it, and then you'll wanna type in and then save it again and to re-upload it. Okay, so if you hover over each of these little blue sections, you'll see in the, the yellow text or the yellow box what needs to be put there. And say you forget that, you can scroll back up and it walks you through here. I and then your first and last name of the landowner. So I'm just gonna be everybody today. Ijalisa Dawkins, landowner of parcel number, actually put in the real parcel number that you pulled from the auditor's website, um, located at, and then put the address. Give express consent to, and this should be the garden name, to use this land to perform the activities outlined in this proposal for the 2020 Urban Gardening Grant from, and then this is gonna be a date. So whatever date you selected um, in the actual application is what you'll put here. Okay. And then you'll come down here and the landowner and the project manager need to sign this. So you'll actually type in the name, the phone number, and email address. And then you'll sign. So you'll want to print this out. You can put the date here. Type in the project manager name and the same contact information, the date. Print it out, have them sign, re-upload. And they'll actually attach it here. So remember where you saved it, go to that application acknowledgement form and select attach. Okay, we already went through the parcel summary document. These are the instructions in detail. Um, it's just telling you to go to the website, select search by address, and then you'll see the parcel ID number there. You'll hit print parcel summary, download, and then you will upload it right here. Okay, I'm gonna have Carol go over the budget and the product request, and that will complete our um, required application attachments, and then I'll come back and talk about um, some of the optional attachments. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks, Jalisa. Are you comfortable to keep driving the computer? Uh-huh. All right, so who here loves a good budget? Huh? Oh, I actually got a couple people admitting it with me. Okay, we're pals. Um, so this should be pretty simple and straightforward. That's our goal. But I, when I have um, gone to design a program or prepare a grant application in past years, I often would start with the budget because I think that really gives you the blueprint of everything that follows. Not that the narrative is not important, it's very important, and Jalisa did a great job explaining why and how to put that together successfully, but that is all built on top of the plan. What are you going to do with the dollars and the resources at your disposal for this project? And so the budget looks, I believe, similar to how it has in past years. There's a couple differences I wanted to highlight. It is in two sections, and this top section is where you would put your cash requests. And so you will 
there are several different little subtopics you can group your expenses under. You can see other, which is always our favorite category. Uh, if you go back up, Jalisa, so there's supplies and contractual labor. Um, labor is something, I don't know about you, but I think that's just so important. You don't want to, you want to get the estimate right, and you don't want to forget that you do need to pay people. I mean, yes, we all have volunteers, and they, they have a lot of value, but you also may find that this project will not happen without a specific contractor or uh, labor. And if I forget to get that cost covered, this person may not show up, and our project may fail. So the other thing I wanted to point out under supplies is that there is a tool library. How many of you are familiar with the tool library? Yeah, I'd say a lot of you. And that is an incredible resource for um, garden programs around Central Ohio. So uh, there is a, I think there's a link up here, right? It's, it's um, pretty handy. So if you are putting together your budget and you're thinking, well, what are all of the things we're going to need in 2020, be sure you're checking the tool library to see, is there something that I could borrow for free, maybe a tiller or something like that, and then we don't have to pay for it and house it throughout the year. So really do take a good look at that. And then supplies... It's called Montcom Living now, um, but it's the tool library. But there's some information up there. Um, grab that on your way out and look at it. Great. So it's called Modcon, Modcon. Modcon Living, and there's a handout in the back. Okay. Thanks, Bill. All right. So does that all make sense? Any questions about the cash portion of the budget so far? It's, it's pretty simple. I would, I would also encourage you, don't neglect purpose. Um, you could put more details, any, anything you can do. I mean, now I am on the review committee, so maybe I shouldn't admit this, but you want to really make sure we know that every expense you list here is essential. So that purpose line is, is there to help you make your case. If you just put a barbecue grill, that might be a great uh, idea, but you'd have to really show um, if that fits the purpose of the garden and the grant, and it may not. All right, so can you scroll down, Jalisa? Um, so you can see it should auto-calculate for you um, up to that $3,000 mark to help you know uh, if you need to scale back or if you're on target with your request. And then the second section is for your product requests. And so this would be the uh, consumables, the, the growing media, mulch, plant food that you would like to request for your garden. Uh, every year we do have some gardens that don't request any product, and that's okay too, and you can leave that zero. But if you are interested and you think that this would be valuable, we will be providing product as we have for so many past years. And we've given you the, the type of product, the quantity uh, of each unit, each bag or box, but here's what I wanted to, to show you. I think in past years, we, we did it up to a total of two pallets. Does that sound right? Um, just to be a little bit more flexible, what we've done this year is we have made this so that when you calculate, I think I need 50 bags of soil. If you put the number 50 under quantity requested, it's going to tell you how much that is worth. And so all you, you don't have to worry about pallet counts or calculating costs. It's there for you. So you, should, you can just play around until you get it to the amount that you need and up to a maximum of $600 worth of product. And that is based on the average product award. It's actually a little bit higher than the average product award. And Jalisa, you need to temper your uh, request there. It's, it's going to be denied. Oh, it's like the price is right. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so hopefully that's simple and easy to use. Just think about the quantity. You can do some back of the envelope calculations in another document or something to figure out, you know, how many cubic feet of soil, for example, you might need. And then you can go up to $600 in your request. All right. So that's, that's really the budget. Um, does that all make sense? Any thoughts or questions about that? I can see you're all getting very excited with me, so thanks. Thank you, Carol. And the other thing I want to point out is make sure you include the garden name here. The 
this helps with our reviewers so we don't have to handwrite each garden name on each of the documents. So go ahead and include that. All right. So once you've completed that, you want to make sure you save that as well. And you'll want to upload. And so say you realize you made a mistake or you, you, know, you wanted to add something else to the budget after you've already uploaded it. You can remove it, edit the document, save it, and then re-upload. You, you can edit anything up until the point that you submit. All right, so in the past, we did not have this, and it's still, it's not required, but if you would like to include a letter of support, you can include up to one. If you would like to include a map, a drawing, or the plan for the garden, um, you can include that here as well. Sometimes, you know, our ideas don't necessarily, they don't lend themselves to words. Sometimes a picture is better. We're not looking for, um, you know, uh, elaborate drawings. This can be a stick figure or, you know, you can use crayons, whatever, to get your point across. And then if you would like to include a current photo of the garden or area where the garden will exist, say this is a new garden, then you can feel free to do that as well. And you can upload. And as you see, these are not required, so you can submit um, without uploading those documents. However, if you didn't upload the budget and product request, the acknowledgement form, or the parcel summary document, you won't be able to go on to the next document or the next page to submit. So I hit save and continue. And then this is where you can review all of the information that you um, that you just typed in and see if there are any errors. You can hit edit and you can go back to that page to edit the information. So you can go through all of these different sections and then you'll hit submit. Just want to add that once you've submitted your application, you will get a confirmation message um, to your email address. And so um, if you don't receive that confirmation, you want to get in touch with us at the Columbus Foundation and we can check in and see where the status of your application is um, and make sure that happens. So be sure to let us know because without that confirmation going to you, um, you know, we there is not a guarantee that it was received. So you're welcome to give us a call or shoot us an email and we can confirm that. It's really important. Make sure you have that confirmation. Okay, so then the last document I'm going to go over before I pass it on again is the final report. So this is for the Columbus and Franklin County Community Garden Grant. You have not turned in your final reports yet because they are not due until November or something. And then has Scott's, have you all returned yours yet? Scots are due August 31st. Okay. And they yeah. are coming in, so thank you all for that. <laughs> Good. Um, it's really important to get those final reports in. Um, and so that is definitely something that we look at. If you have not returned your final report, um, maybe this grant was a, a little too much to, um, to handle for the next year. Um, so you want to make sure you get those final reports in, or we may not be able to review your application. And we realize that this um, application deadline is before the final report for the Columbus and Franklin County Community Garden Grant, so you don't have to get the final report in before you submit this application, but um, you still need to make sure that it's in. It'll, um, it will be due, and we will have reviewed them before you get the final decision on the 2020 grant. Does that make sense? Okay. So you'll complete all of this information. And I'm not going to go through these question by question, but it's, um, I think that it's really helpful to read through the final report as you're completing the application. 
Um, and you also want to just take a look at the final report throughout the growing season so that you can make sure that you're documenting what you need to. Um, if you, you know, haven't achieved something, maybe you still have a little bit of time before um, the growing season is over or this final report is due for you to be able to achieve that. And we're asking for, I, I um, alluded to this earlier with the table, we want to know the plants that are grown, the pounds, so if you don't have a scale, you can contact us and we can try to help you um, figure out what the weights are. Um, and so if you go over this, go ahead and give um, the help desk or Haley a call and um, we can work through um, how to add additional plants grown and pounds grown. Don't worry about this area over here, the total pounds, it'll automatically calculate for it for us, and it's not like this is a competition, so we're not looking for you to grow a 1,000 pounds or anything. This is just whatever you have grown because different um, plants weigh different things. This is just something for our metrics. And then if you um, have held events, keep just a log of the events that you've done, the dates, how many people attended, and then a brief description. You don't have to go into a lot of detail, but just it helps us to see um, if the goals that you put into the application are being achieved. All right, and then, so you will get the approved budget once you find out um, the award. And you'll want to make sure that you include in the final report the amount that was approved and what you actually spent on that. We know it can differ. It, it can differ by $5. It can differ you know, by 20 whatever. Um, but just make sure that you include that spent amount here. And hold on to receipts. Um, we may ask for that proof of purchase. And if there's something, say you were approved for something and, um, you know, the amount that you requested was um, less than the amount um, that it actually cost, then we may be able to um, manipulate the budget, but you have to call, um, call us to make sure that that's approved before you actually make those purchases. All right, and then you can feel free, because the final reports are emailed in, so you can attach pictures, if you would like, um, of um, your garden. So um, at the top of the final reporting form, you'll see the section where it requests the grant ID number. So that ID number is located on the grant agreement that um, your, uh, the fiscal agent or your organization, if you're a nonprofit, will receive um, when you're issued the grant agreement. But if you have questions about that number, you can contact us and we can confirm what that is. It's really helpful for us um, to be able to track on when your final report's turned in what what record it's linked to. Um, and then I would also add, uh, if you're attaching um, images, sometimes um, you know we run into limits on the capacity of you know an email. Uh, so you can always combine this document into um, a PDF with images, if that might be easier, if you would really like to share some images. But again, ask us or reach out to us if you have questions. Great, thank you. All right, so I'm going to pass it on to Bill, and he is going to talk about some of the additional grant opportunities. Okay, so first of all, I'm happy. Happy to see some returning faces, happy to see some new faces in here wanting to start garden projects, and happy that it's raining. Um, our gardens have needed it, and this is a good rain at a good time, so I'm happy about that. And um, where'd it go? I wanted to just show how they would actually get to this document. Oh, okay, yep. great. So again, on that grant homepage, go to that section that has all of the documents there and additional garden grant um, opportunities. And this isn't totally all-inclusive. There are grants out there depending on what your mission is, uh, depending on what your purpose is. So be looking all the time. And if you find a great one, let me know so I can pass it on uh, to others and we can include it in this page. Uh, but things like, you know, if you're doing art in the garden, uh, the Greater Columbus Arts Council is great. Columbus Soup has an annual grant that you can buy for. They vote with spoons um, for your project. You go and present at an event, and um, people actually vote on your project by putting spoons in a cup. Uh, 
Then there's bigger um, national grant opportunities, the APGA, American Public Gardens Association, the National Garden Bureau, um, Slow Food. Then um, if you're working with kids, the kidsgardening.org is one that's really super, and it has a lot of other resources on there too. Many of these um, will have that. We'll have other resources along with the grants, either um, grant writing tips, um, reporting tips, and I can't stress enough what we've all talked about tonight is documentation. Documentation is not just a process in the grant, it's a process in gardening. So we should be taking pictures of our gardens, we should have garden journals, we should be writing things down. I can't remember yesterday sometimes, last year, I don't know. So writing those things down and documenting, going back to that final report and looking at it so you know what you're going to need at the end of the year. So you're not scrambling. You're not scrambling at the very last day to write your grant, and you're not scrambling at the very end to gather all this stuff up or be guessing, which is worse, um, because you want to know. All this whole process um, that we're going over today, I believe, will make us all smarter gardeners, smarter in the process, smarter in the um, planning stage, and sustainability, looking ahead. So all of this, I think, is going to be very helpful for all of us. So there's truck rentals on there, the ModCon uh, Living's Tool Library. Um, check these out and take a look at the different opportunities. Uh, on the conservatory side, we have the resource guide. If you're just starting a project or you want to refer back to that, that resource guide can kind of takes you through the A to Z, O to S, organization to sustainability of getting your garden started and su sustaining it. Uh, the hub gardens are model gardens that are out there already working great. You can take a look at them, go visit them, and um, talk to their great leaders and see how they're doing it. How are they putting on events? How are they sustaining themselves? Uh, how are they working with food pantries and other stakeholders? All of those are important, so take a look at that. A couple fun things coming up I wanted to talk about also was um, this coming Sunday, I invite you all, but I invite you all to go back to your gardens, your neighborhoods, and invite others to come to the conservatory this Sunday for Community Gardens Day. It's also a community day, so it's free admission to the entire conservatory, the children's garden. And we'll have some gardens represented that you can come talk to them about their projects and how um, they've become successful and what they're doing in their projects. Uh, 10 to 5, all day, come to the conservatory, free admission. That's this Sunday. And then the Grown to Green Awards. To me, that's another funding opportunity if you haven't nominated. The nominations are already in, but that's an opportunity once you get your project going and you feel like it is the best education garden, that you have a great youth that's showing leadership, nominate them, that you have uh, maybe the best community garden in the city, nominate, uh, doing educational prog programming, nominate. They're all cash awards. And then we have a great uh, awesome potluck on uh, September 12th. It's coming up very quickly. Uh, Thursday night at the conservatory where we celebrate and honor those uh, winners of those garden projects, those categories. And it's a big potluck. We all bring in food from the gardens and uh, break bread together and enjoy the, the harvest of the season. Um, I'm missing anything. I don't think so. I think that's what I wanted to talk about was, um, yep. Yeah, we'll go ahead. Thank you, Bill. We'll go ahead and bring up Seth from the Land Bank, and he can talk about the opportunities that they have. Hi, I'm Seth Braham from the City of Columbus Land Bank. Uh, officially, we're the Land Redevelopment Division in the City's Department of Development. Uh, we currently have, uh, we own something like 1,800 properties where several hundred of those are listed on our website. Those properties that are listed on the website, unless otherwise stated, could be licensed for a community garden. Uh, you go through an application process with us that you can get from our, our website. It's only $10. Well, $50 the first year to apply uh, for a piece of land, and then the renewal is currently $10. Part of the benefits of being in our program is you're getting a usually, on average, a 4,500 square foot residentially zoned parcel. 
uh, available. And then what we do on the backside to kind of help prop everybody up is we provide 50-gallon uh, tanks to first-year gardens and then 550-gallon uh, tanks later on as you fully develop your property. And then because we are a city office, we work with our compost facility and public utilities to be able to provide uh, free ComTill or ComTill Plus up to 10 cubic yards per uh, licensee. And then the final thing that my office does is we provide a small uh, kind of mini grant of either 150 or $200, depending on if you're a current gardener with one or multiple parcels, or if you're a new gardener, if you're new, then you're going to get a little bit of a bigger bump than some of the uh, existing gardens. And so those are the things we do. Uh, I probably said this before, but it's currently uh, you get an annual license. All of them expire on March 31st, and then you have an opportunity to renew, assuming you're in good standing following the terms of our license agreement, and that you're also developing and growing either food or flowers on those properties. Now, if you're licensing it and you're just mowing it, you know, I wouldn't expect to get that property back a second year. Um, and currently, uh, if you're successful in our program for three years on the annual license and you're also a nonprofit, you do have an opportunity to apply for then a five-year lease. So we kind of go through our program where we want to graduate people and that as you're successful, we're willing to commit more long-term because uh, probably as many of you know, uh, we do have a housing shortage in Columbus, which has really caused a lot of our housing prices to escalate. So that's something my office always has to balance where we want to support uh, our friends at Public Health with growing food, but we also want to support our um, the rest of our city and giving people places to live that are clean and safe. So that's in a nutshell. Again, uh, my email is swhbrehm at columbus.gov. If you want to email me, that's the best way to get a hold of me. And you can reach out to me before you apply if you have any questions. All right. Thank you, Seth. And if you didn't get his email address, I have a card back there, and I talk to Seth frequently, so I can get you in contact with him. All right. So at this point, we are going to open it up to questions. Jaleesa. Um, can I just ask you to quickly show the group um, where they might access their in-progress application on the dashboard? Mm -hmm. um, so earlier, uh, when you, she was going through the application, um, you could save and continue, or you could save and exit. And if you're midway through the application and you need to press pause, you can save and exit, and then uh, Jaleesa will show you where you can access that application later. So you'll make sure you log in, and then where your name is, you select that arrow, my dashboard. And then on the left-hand side, you hit Applications. And I have many. You should only have one. <laughs> but um, you'll select Resume on whichever one is um, the actual one you want to submit. And once you have submitted it, it will say it'll still be listed there, but it'll be listed as submitted, and so you won't be able to edit it at that point. Thanks, Haley. Okay, do we have any questions? And um, I'm going to bring the mic, or we will bring the mic to you so that um, you can be heard. And yeah. So just raise your um, hand if you do have a question. Hi, I have a question about the acknowledgement form. Like some of the gardens that we have for beautification or pollinators are on city land. So, like Columbus Recreation and Parks or Columbus City Schools. So, what level of signature do you really need? Because I, I can see getting a principal signature, but I don't know how how high we could go. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say that the principal would be able to sign off on that um, if it's a, a large organization like that. And you can always call because I. I it's hard to just give a blanket statement. Um, so if you have something that's not a school, but um, you know, it may be a little more complex, go ahead and call that grant help desk number. And I should have shown where you can find that. So down at the bottom of the landing page, this is the email address and there's the phone number for that grant help desk. Other questions? Thank you very much. 
Uh, this is related to the previous question. Um, so I run a community garden, um, which is the property, the deed, the title, whatever is in actually their name. So who would be the one to sign it? Would it be the executive director of the nonprofit? So you said you run a community garden for yes. a nonprofit? Which owns the property. Oh, okay. It was donated in kind of them like 10 years ago. Okay, yeah. Whoever the executive director is um, would be able to sign. All right, perfection. And um, if he's unavailable, would an employee suffice? Because I'm also the garden coordinator and I do work there part-time as well. Um, we do want the executive, the person that's the highest level to be able to sign for that, that land. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. And we did have a couple um, last year. We would get the um, application acknowledgement back and see that um, the name didn't necessarily match up with um, the owner that was on that parcel summary document on the um, auditor's website. And it didn't kick you out. We called you or emailed to get the information, gave a deadline for being able to get back to us so that we could resolve that. We know that some of the information is a little tricky to get. Ms. Dawkins, a uh, question about staffing, paying staff. Is there a percentage of the grant that could go to staffing folks or what is that? Because normally it's not been allowed, so I just wanted to know that. Yeah, unfortunately because of the amount that we have to disperse to the gardens, um, we're unable to pay staff. We know that it's something that um, is necessary. Um, but we are unable to, with the limited funds that we have, um, to pay for staffing. So for contracting um, services, so say you need a fence built. Mm -hmm. for, for so a contracted person can be paid. Yes, but it's not like to manage. A seasonal gardener, but a project. So don't have big enough voice. Uh, so a seasonal project. Um, or not a seasonal gardener, but if you're building raised beds, if you're putting up a small greenhouse, something that's beyond your scope of work that you need a professional for, um, that's contracted services, contractual. But uh, not to contract a gardener to take care of your garden season long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. This, <clears throat> this is back to the problem of, of somebody signing. We're a church garden. The pastor doesn't own the church, doesn't own the property. Who do we go to? He would be represent would he not be representative of the owners of the of the garden? Uh, the pastor would be representative of the yeah. Thank you. But they're gonna look the reviewers will look at that document of who owns the land. And it may be a corporation, it may be a church organization, and not have a name attached to it, so then the pastor would be representative. And so this, this question is around um, who can apply uh, if you have someone in a community that has multiple uh, farm sites. Uh, that are of different names and pretty much the same goals, would they both be able to apply um, if they're operated or um, by two different nonprofits but the same fiscal agent? So it's multiple properties that are owned by different nonprofits? Um, well, currently they're by the same nonprofit, but uh, they're in the process of... That's the landowner or the project manager? Project manager. Okay. Um, and so it'll be handled by, you know, it's looking at another nonprofit, taking it on, but currently, it, and so it's our civic association that currently uh, has those, but uh, it may be necessary for a separate nonprofit to take over responsibility of one of the projects. Okay, yeah, if there are two different project sites, they're separate gardens, then each of them can apply for the, the, okay. for the grant. 
Mm -hmm. um, and just just another question around funding. Um, when do you anticipate um, funding being made available? Would it actually be in 2020 or would it be available before then? And just even one more thing on that is I know that last year you shared, um, I think it was 2000, but you had an estimate of what actual, you know, kind of a realistic amount that it would be the average amount that a grant would really be. So for the second part, this is the first time that we're offering this $3,000 amount with our grants all having one application and one review process. So we really have no idea what the average grant amount award is going to be. Um, it just depends on what is um, being requested, how much is being requested, and how much we have to um, issue out. And then Haley will answer the question for when funds should be distributed. So you will be receiving um, notification, initial notification of your grant um, outcome in December, but we will be issuing grant agreements in January. So by around the second week of January, um, by that time, you, your fiscal sponsor, um, executive director, and the project manager, so those two individuals that you noted on the application, they will receive an email that, that constitutes the grant agreement. Um, once that's printed, signed, and sent back to us, we initiate the payment process. So it usually from the time of receiving that grant um, agreement that's signed, we have checks out the do door in about 10 business days. So um, I just encourage you when you see that email to get it to us as soon as you can. And you're always, um, as I've said before, welcome to give us a call to check in on, um, on the process and I can give you a better timeline. Going back to that relationship with your fiscal agent, you know, so they know to notify you. You both get the email, but um, sometimes communication needs to be so that you know that they've received uh, information, so they know you've received information. Uh, there's been times in the past that, you know, people are waiting on each other to let them know that, hey, there's a check waiting or there's notification waiting in your inbox. So keep that communication up between your, your fiscal agent, the person that's uh, receiving notica not notification as well. So if the project is more about um, increasing green space or beautification or having like a, you know, a, a, a beautiful place for people to go and less about growing produce, what's, what's the obligation in the reporting about um, the, the quantity and the poundage of plants? Like, you know, are we expected to report on flowers and, and things like that? Well, if you're going to say up front that it is beautification and, and cover all that in your impact, how you're going to impact folks, um, we'll know right away it's not about growing food. It's about impact with beauty and safety and uh, events and, and gatherings and community. We'll know that right up front when you write your description about you know uh, your project and what you're doing. And in the final report, you'll want to make sure you list what you did plant. But yeah, you can't really say how many pounds. Um, but it'll be important to include pictures um, if that is your purpose for the garden. Okay, along the lines of beautification, um, it's actually a church property with a school and it's a complete block itself. So there are gardens spread over the entire area in different locations. So can that be done like certain things in the different gardens on the same piece of property as far as beautification and for the neighborhood? So you're saying can, so you apply for $3,000 and it's for X, Y, and Z things. Can you spread that, the, the things that you're funded for over all of those gardens? Yes. Yes. Okay. If they're a part of the same plot. Oh, yes. And they're the same parcel number. Yes. Well. <laughs> so we know your entire growing space. Sorry, this has to be recorded. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. 
Any more questions? Okay, I have some couple pieces of information, and then I'll open it up again for brief questions, because we're doing really great on time. This makes me incredibly happy. Okay, so um, the due date for the applications is October the 31st at 11.59. As I already said, make sure that you plan ahead for those application acknowledgement forms. Because if it's not complete, we will not be able to review um, the applications and it'll be disqualified, okay? So Haley already announced when um, you will find out about um, your awards and when checks will be um, cut. April the 17th of 2020 is the Earth Day celebration that'll be held at Franklin Park Conservatory. And so that's where you'll be able to pick up your product donations and um, participate in the great um, celebration that we have. Make sure you include transportation costs in your budget. You know, include the price of the truck to get that product from, um, the, or from Franklin Park Conservatory to your garden. There is a frequently asked questions document. So again, I'm on this landing page. And if you scroll down, select that frequently asked questions um, document and go ahead and just read through. Um, I think there are some, some, there's some great information there. I'm biased because I created it, but <laughs> you can tell me. Um, you can still call um, if you do not feel like this is an adequate um, explanation or there's something that's not included on that form, okay? And then, as I said, the grant help desk. So Haley is there to answer questions about technical issues or logging in um, with the um, Columbus Foundation website. And there is her contact information. So I'm, once you click it, it goes to your email. And then Nicole is for any questions, you know, you need um, further explanation of a question in the application or um, you don't know who the landowner, um, whose signature you should get for the landowner. Questions like that should go to Nicole. And then we have free soil testing, and I did not bring the, the flyer, but again, my business card is in the back. Um, if you are a garden that is in the city of Columbus or providing food to city of Columbus residents, then there is free soil testing for you. And then the Point app is, uh, is a website that you can go to to help you find volunteers um, for your garden. And so the address um, is https colon backslash backslash point app, that's p-o-i-n-t-a-p-p dot org backslash charity. And... Okay, I'm gonna ask for any additional questions and then we're gonna do the, the raffle drawing. So, any questions right now? Um, I know earlier Bill mentioned that they were having uh, the open house at Franklin Park uh, this Sunday. I was wondering if there's a digital flyer that they might be able to share that we can share to our community on that. I don't think it was one on the Grow to Green. It's in the Growing to Green newsletter. If you got the newsletter, Today, it's, no, yesterday, Monday. What's today? Yeah, Monday. Uh, it came out. And that's another uh, resource for you guys if, if you want to follow the Grown to Green newsletter. Uh, I try to update it regularly with educational opportunities, grants, resources, and you just need to contact me uh, at bdawson at fpconservatory.org uh, to get that newsletter. Um, I believe it's on our website as well about community. I know Community Day is Community Gardens Day was in the newsletter. And uh, when you were talking about reporting, um, if you got some past funding or product, I believe. And so um, I know that I received product from Scott's from a 2018 application. We did not receive funds, but we got product, which we picked up during Earth Day. 2019 mm -hmm. is there any type of reporting no is there something for a product only 
So yes, for the product only grantees uh, for Scotts, we do ask that you complete the same final reporting form that um, is included on our website. So um, that document's located in the nonprofit toolkit um, in the nonprofit center that we reviewed earlier. And here I'll just jump in. Um, so moving forward, you know, again, as Jalisa said, this year we'll see what shakes out in terms of what the awards look like. But we would appreciate um, final reporting on on your grant award. So just as a reminder, now some of the questions may not apply. Of course, the budget budget documentation, that kind of thing wouldn't apply. But um, in the toolkit, you have final report forms. And so currently, because we are transitioning from last year's two program process to this new one, you can see the 2019 final report for City of Columbus Gardens and um, the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation Gardens final report. So this is what you would complete for your award last year. And then um, the Urban Gardening Grant report is, will be permanently located in the toolkit now moving forward as well. So as you anticipate uh, next year. Any final questions? Is the Growing to Green newsletter the same that one that was mentioned uh, earlier in the discussion? Uh, the resource page is on the, on the um, city grant page, correct? The Growing to Green newsletter is separate. It's through me, and you can just email me and say, sign me up if you aren't getting it. I'm getting yours. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, let's have a drum roll for the produce scale here. And the winner is Minister Aaron Hopkins. <laughs> All right, we'll conclude this the formal program and if you do have any questions we'll be hanging out around for a little bit but we do absolutely have to be out of here by 6 50 okay so we can talk in the parking lot for five minutes after that but they're going to shoo us out at seven <laughs> thank you